are thrilled to have Cameron Norman performing special music today. Cameron is a student at Jacksonville University, currently working towards her BA in music. Her focus is on vocal performance and opera, something she has adored since a very early age. She also has a love for the piano and has recently begun to dabble in guitar, motivated by her very large family of musicians. Cameron is delighted to share the gift of music through performance and looks forward to bringing the wonder of opera to anyone she can. Carmen. Our opening words today are a reading number 606 in our gray hymnal, The Tao by Lao Tse. Before creation, a presence existed, self-contained, complete, formless, voiceless, mateless, changes, changeless, which we are yet pervaded itself with unending motherhood. There can be no name for it, but I have called it the way of life. Perhaps I should have called it the fullness of life, since fullness implies widening into space, implies still further widening, implies widening until the circle is whole. In that sense, the way of life is fulfilled. People rounding the way of earth earth rounding the way of heaven, heaven rounding the way of life, till the circle is full. Good morning and welcome to all. My name is Donna Zimmerman and I will be your worship leader this morning. My pronouns are she and her. If you are new to this church or to our faith, you will find Unitarian Universalists travel many paths to discover purpose and meaning in our lives. However, 
we unite in our belief in the worth and dignity of everyone. We believe it's our obligation to express our faith through acts of compassion and justice. We're people who are active, actively intellectual, invite spiritual growth, our kids ask questions and think. We practice a life-affirming faith and embrace people who are hurting or bereaved. I want to take this opportunity to welcome first-time or returning visitors who are here with us today. We're so glad to have you here, and we hope you feel welcome and will want to get to know us. If you haven't already done so, be sure to stop by our welcome table as you passed when you came in. The folks at the table will be happy to answer your questions, and they'll be glad to introduce you to someone who may be of help. You're invited to sign in as a guest and get a name tag so that we can get to know you by name. We offer regular Learn About BBUUC classes, and if you're interested in those, or at the point of interested in becoming a member, our membership chair, Julie Smithers, will be happy to talk to you about the path to membership. You can also ask anyone who has a tag, a sticker on their name tag that says, new, ask me. Kind of self-explanatory there. If you are ready to jump in and help out, we're always looking for volunteers. You have opportunities to help out with refreshments in the kitchen, and if you're interested, there are volunteer sign-up sheets on the back table at the far end of the church. We would, like every, we would like to invite everyone to join us after the service today for refreshments, fair trade coffee, and conversation. They are served in the outside patio. You can get there by walking straight down the center hallway through the uh, classrooms or on either side of the church, follow the sidewalk to the outside patio. Our service today is also special in a different way. Most of the elements were selected by the Reverend Rod Richards, who is a UU minister currently serving the San Luis Obispo, California congregation. From time to time, ministers will share their efforts in building Sunday services, and the, when the message is this good, we are delighted to offer it to our own congregation. Our own David Dean will add his personality and voice to the sermon as it was written by Reverend Richards. Please remain seated and join me in reciting our Congregational Covenant, which is on the inside of the Order of Service, halfway down the, the inside page. We covenant to engage one another with honesty, kindness, and respect, to value diversity, seek understanding of our differences, and practice gracious accountability with care, love, and empathy. We make these promises to those who are here and those yet to come, so that we may be a safe, welcoming, and beloved community of acceptance, learning, and transformation. Now, if you will, please rise in body or spirit, singing the call to worship, and the words are printed in your order of service on the front page. our chalice each Sunday as a symbol of our faith. Cindy Damon will come forward as I read number 614 from our hymnal. We light this chalice in celebration of what Black Elk, medicine man, and sacred clown of the Lakota people called the sacred hoop. He said, then I was standing on the highest mountain of them all 
and round about beneath me was the whole hoop of the world. And while I stood there, I saw more than I can tell and understood more than I saw. For I was seeing in a sacred manner the shape of all things in the spirit and the shape of all shapes as they must live together like one being. And I saw that the sacred hoop of my people was one of many hoops that made one circle. Wide as daylight and as starlight. And in the center grew one mighty flowering tree to shelter all the children of one mother and father. And I saw that it was holy. Now please rise in body or spirit and join in singing our opening hymn number 360, Here We Have Gathered. It's an easy tune, but not one we've done recently. So Gary's going to play it first, one time through, and then we're going to sing all three verses. in our church, we take up an offering. It's good to remind ourselves that the offering is symbolic as well as practical. We know that through pledges, we build our budget, fund our programs and ministries, pay our staff, and finance the comfort and beauty of our building. Many choose to submit those pledge funds electronically to the church at any time that it's convenient for them. However, we continue to pass the plate 
during our worship service to make a community expression of thanks for the blessing of abundance, to visibly bring in the harvest at this most cherished hour of our week. Our offering says that the act of giving is, an, is essential to our spiritual well-being as anything else we do here on Sunday mornings. During this time-honored ritual, even if your offering is simply symbolic because you give digitally, please take the plate and pass it to your neighbor. Cindy Jorgensen and Marilyn Jones will now come forward to gather the offering.
Today's reading is from Agnostic, A Spirited Manifesto by Leslie Hazelton. A classic Zen exercise is the Enso, the circle hand-drawn in a single fluid brushstroke. It is close to perfect, but never there. If perfection is what you want, you can produce it anytime by using a compass or a computer. But the Enso defies such mechanistic precision. Indeed, it is often incomplete, left slightly open as though an invitation to everything beyond it. And each one is different, never the same circle twice. You can see the hairs of the brush in the drag of the ink on paper, trace the fluidity of the moment when the stillness of meditation was released in one rapid stroke, sense the calm grace of the artist. The beauty of the Zen circle lies precisely or more precisely, imprecisely, in its imperfection. That is what speaks to us and draws us in. A perfect circle is uninteresting, a closed system containing nothing, while an imperfect one vibrates with warmth. It invites us into the moment of its creation, into that single deep exhalation as the hand arcs through the air, the brush over the paper. It is open, humid, fallible, an expression that is of soul. Draw the circle wide. It's never been easy for me to draw a circle freehand. I mean a real circle. For one thing, I'm left-handed. I know, that's no excuse. And I don't mean to offend left-handers who are supremely confident circle drawers. But if you're left-handed, you may know how pencil markings can smear as your hand moves across the page. So I remember a lot of smeared circles in grade school. Plus, I don't happen to be very good at drawing in general. And I just can't figure this out, except for the fact that I put absolutely no time or effort into getting any better at it. But I remember when I was asked to draw circles as a child in school, they always came out as sad little ovals. Circle-like, perhaps, but not circles. Not real circles. And then I used a compass. And I remember that seemed quite magical to me. Even though I may have ripped the paper with the sharp point, I'll blame it on the fact I'm left-handed, as illogical as that may be. But I remember watching this shape form. Finally, a proper circle, a perfect circle, all points equidistant from the center. And I thought, well, I can do that. And I tried it. Freehand, all points equidistant from the center, I thought. All points equal, well, not on my circles, no. They just didn't come out right. And we Unitarian Universalists like to get things right, don't we? Well, we humans like to get things right. There is that part of our brain, and believe me, I'm no neuroscientist, don't call on me for circle drawing or brain surgery. But I know there is a part of us that yearns to get things right. We have a picture in our head of what we are after, and we are deeply satisfied when we achieve it, and we are deeply dissatisfied if we don't. If we're going to draw a circle, by gosh, we're going to draw a circle. And if we know what a circle is supposed to look like, if we're to draw wider, well, well, it made me wonder. If we're going to draw the circle wider, don't we also have to draw it longer in order for it to remain a circle, all points, equidistance, and all that? And I see, I see shaking heads, puzzled looks. I think this guy's missed the point. It's a metaphor, right? Aren't ministers supposed to understand metaphor? But bear with me, just for a few moments. What I'm saying is that 
drawing the circle wider is something of a messy proposition, unpleasant even, if we are stuck on making the perfect circle. Have you ever seen the reorganization that takes place when we've gathered together in a circle? Say, a, a congregational group or a gathering of some sort. We're gathered in a circle, and then we realize we have more people attending than what the circle holds. We, we scooch our chairs, we add chairs, we realize that we now have a, a curvy, chaotic configuration that does not quite meet the circle standards because we can't all see each other. And we're maybe, maybe we're in a straight line that curves at the edges and sometimes a wavy line or a real wavy line. Like if you end up sitting, someone sitting behind you, you know you're not in a circle. So we scooch some more. We, and, and maybe we have to move a table to spread out a little further. And then we might end up realizing that the room will not lend itself to a perfect circle. So we have to make it, we have to make it good enough to make do, to make the less than perfect circle, to hold the people who are present. But how do we do it? How do we go about drawing the circle wider? Do we sigh in frustration as we look at the new oblong configuration that once was our beautiful circle? Do we harumph as we skid the table across the floor? Do we resent the interruption of these scheduled activities? We're visibly flabbergasted by the delay. Are we visibly upset when returning to the chair we were sitting in, we now find it occupied by a newcomer? And damn it, the only reason that it was open because we were nice enough to get up, set out more chairs. And now we have to look for a new seat. And, and on one of those chairs, we don't like sitting in. And, and sure enough, we end, up at, we end up actually sitting behind someone in this now deeply imperfect circle. How do we go about drawing the circle wider? All right, I've been probably guilty of the task with something less than graciousness at times. Feeling all those things that I just mentioned and letting it show as I sought to get back to the matters at hand. But let me tell you, this making room, rearranging, drawing the circle wider, this is not an interruption or a delay of the work at hand. This is the work. Draw the circle wider or longer. Have it snake around immovable objects. Travel up and down across risers. Find the shape it needs to take. Do whatever you need to do to allow more people to be included. Don't get hung up on the perfect circle. It's made up of people, after all. Focus on the joy of welcoming, not the frustration of rearranging. And prepare for the work. Marilyn beautifully shared with us through the words of Leslie Hazelton that the ENSO in Zen practice, the circle, hand-drawn in a single fluid brush stroke, is often incomplete, left slightly open as though an invitation to everything beyond it. We can cut down on some of that frustration of rearranging if we prepare for the work. Any circle we make should have an opening. Sometimes we inadvertently, unintentionally close that opening, delighting in the construction of a perfect circle. But we're not looking for perfection. We're looking for inclusion, invitation. Draw the circle wide was a theme of the Pacific Southwest District Assembly in 2016 at the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara, and I took a few notes from that gathering. Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, now president of the Unitarian Universal Association, who we heard here a couple of weeks ago, when she was a candidate 
for the UUA presidency, and yes, there is a campaign and an election, she asked, how are we accountable to the people who haven't found us yet? Reverend Allison Miller, who was also running for president of the UUA and who I, David, knew at All Souls in New York City when she was first studying for the ministry, asked, how must we adapt and change to welcome people who thirst for our healing message? This faith, said Reverend Rosemary Bray McNatt, president of the Star King School for Ministry, this faith saves lives. Saves lives. I want to save our lives as citizens and human beings, she said. I want to save our lives as citizens and human beings. That clear purpose has only grown more urgent in the past few years. We have something precious to offer in that endeavor. This faith, I have seen it, saves lives. So how are we accountable to the people who haven't found us yet? How must we adapt and change to welcome people who thirst for our healing message? Draw the circle wide. Draw it wider still. We need to leave an opening in our circle, right? Taking a lesson from the ENSO in Zen practice. And that came to mind with our opening hymn this morning. Here we have gathered, gathered side by side, circle of kinship, come and step inside. And just picturing that in my mind, I thought, how does one step inside a circle. When I imagine a circle, it is closed. The end of the line meets the point where it begins, but the circle we're talking about is different. It is indeed more of an end so. If someone is to step inside, there must be an opening, which also means that the circle can be described as perpetually incomplete, which for those of us who want to get things right, can lead to great anxiety. But what promise it holds? What promise if we are willing to adapt and change in order to welcome people who thirst for our healing message? What promise if we leave an opening in our circle, set, us, set aside an open chair, or two, or three, even give up our choice seat, and find another place among the, along the new imperfect curves of inclusion we have created so that all have a place. I've watched people enter a room and encounter a closed circle. And even though people graciously scooch, they make room, they provide a chair, there is an uncomfortable, unintentional message that we didn't expect you would be here and, and now we must move, we must open the circle, we must be inconvenienced in order to accommodate your unexpected arrival. That initial moment and the feelings it carries can never be reclaimed. We could have prepared an invitation to join an opening in the circle, an empty chair, but instead we have given the feeling that we are politely accommodating an intrusion. And now, God forbid, the near perfection of our circle is ruined as you just can't get everybody to see exactly how they should move to retain geometric purity. But the beauty of the Zen circle the beauty of the circle we invoke when we encourage ourselves to draw the circle wider. The beauty of that circle lies precisely, or more precisely, imprecisely, in its imperfection. Draw the circle wide. 
draw the circle wider than what we expect as necessary. Each and every circle we create. May we leave an opening in every circle as an invitation. May we add a chair or two whenever we gather together. May we draw on the wide side of the brain, the side that knows that inviting in, making room, offering welcome, changing our shape is never an interruption or delay of what we do. It is what we do. It is central. Or thereabouts. Let's not get hung up on the geometry. Rather, let us practice the sacred flexibility that allows us to give up our geometric purity when it comes to our circles so that we are unafraid to draw them wider, stretch them longer, find the joy in the rearranging. Let us be fearless in our willingness to make new shapes so that we may be accountable to people who have not found us yet, so that we may welcome those who thirst for our healing message, so that we may engage with our people and our partners the work before us to save our lives as citizens and human beings. And as Leslie Hazelton wrote in Marilyn's reading earlier, a perfect circle is uninteresting, a closed system containing nothing, while an imperfect one vibrates with warmth. It invites us into the moment of its creation. It is human, open, fallible, an expression that is of soul. So, let us draw our hearts and souls and voices together to sing Circle Round for Freedom. It's hymn number 155 in the gray hymnal, and I want to tell you that if you follow the sheet music, don't look at the top line. The melody's the middle line. So, just to make sure we all have it, Gary will play it through once, and then we will sing Circle Round for Freedom twice. Please rise in body or spirit. Thank you. Please remain standing as I read the closing words and Cindy Damon will return to extinguish the chalice. You won't be alone. We'll be side by side with one another, with people yet to come, with partners we have yet to meet, creating ever widening, perfectly imperfect, precisely imprecise circles and ovals and oblongs and things of beauty 
as we practice sacred flexibility, welcoming love and healing pain and demanding justice and saving lives. Go forth and make some new shapes. May it be so. Our worship has ended. Now get out there and let your service begin.